All right, guys, welcome to our second episode of Insider Insights. Today, we're speaking with Nir Eyal, who writes, consults, and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. He's also the author of two best-selling books, including Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Nir Eyal. So, Nir, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to start, tell me why you wrote this book, Indistractable. So, uh, as my friend, our mutual friend Gretchen Rubin says, research is me search. And uh, I wrote this book because I had this problem that I found that I was easily distracted by the modern world. <laughs> and in many ways, I would blame. Uh, the things around me, as I think many people do, I think that's what we hear a lot these days in the media, is that you are distracted because Facebook makes you distracted and YouTube makes you distracted and the media makes you distracted and everything makes you distracted. And I followed that advice to some extent. And I said, okay, that's, I'll, I'll take this advice. I'll, I'll go on a digital detox and I'll stop using my devices. And then finally, I'll stop being distracted. And it didn't work. I got a flip phone from Alibaba for like 12 bucks. And uh, you know, the kind we used to use in the nineties, right? And I got I, I, no apps, no internet access. And it didn't work uh, because I would, I would keep, you know, I'd say, oh, look, there's, there's that book on the shelf that I've been meaning to read or my desk needs sorting or uh, let me just take out the trash real quick. And I kept getting distracted. Even when I tried to get rid of the technology that was supposedly, uh, you know, addicting us and distracting us, I still got distracted. And so that's when I realized that distraction is a much bigger problem, a much deeper problem than just what is happening on the outside. It's really about what's happening on the inside. And so I really wanted to explore the deeper psychology behind why do we procrastinate? Why do we get distracted? Not just by technology, but by all sorts of things. Excellent. So what are those reasons beyond just the technology? Because I definitely noticed with my iPhone how much of a distraction it is and we can talk more about the various techniques to limit that and control that. But if it's not my phone that's the issue, it's, it's something that is occurring like within me or my mindset or wh what is that? The first place to start is to understand what is distraction. Uh, I think because it's a common misperception. It certainly was for me. I didn't really understand what distraction was. Uh, and I think the best place to understand what distraction is, is to understand what distraction is not. So if you ask most people, what is the opposite of distraction? they will tell you the opposite of distraction is focus, right? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But that's not exactly right. That the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. That if you look at the origin of both words, traction and distraction, they both come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end, you'll notice, in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction, by definition, is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things done with intent, things that move you closer to your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of traction. The opposite of traction is distraction. Distraction, by definition, is any action that pulls you away from what you plan to do, that is not aligned with your values, that pulls you away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. So this is really important for two reasons. Number one, I'd argue that any action can be a distraction. So I think the most pernicious form, the most dangerous form of distraction is not the video game or social media or you know, something that is obviously a distraction. It's the distraction that tricks us. What kind of distraction tricks us? This used to be my daily routine. I would sit down at my desk and I'd say, okay, I've got that big project I have to work on today. Nothing is gonna distract me. Uh, nothing's gonna take me off track. I'm gonna sit down at my desk and I'm gonna work on that project. Here I go, I'm gonna get started right now. But first, let me just check some email, right? Let me do that one thing on my to-do list that's kind of easy to get started, right? I'll just get some momentum or, or let me just you know, do, do something else real quick that maybe sounds work-related. It sounds like a work-type task that I gotta get done anyway. But if it's not what you plan to do with your time, it is just as much of a distraction. So the most pernicious form of distraction is a distraction that tricks you into prioritizing the urgent and the easy at the expense of the important. 
Okay, so it's the tasks that feel like, well, I got to do it anyway. And then you do that as opposed to the real thing you meant to do. So anything can become a distraction. And I would also argue the second point is that anything can become traction. So I am sick and tired of these chicken little tech critics telling us from some ivory tower that we should stop using technology. Okay, that's really easy for some professor without a social media account who's tenured to tell us to stop using these technologies. We can't, right? Our jobs depend on it, our connections. Can you imagine trying to go through this epidemic without Facebook and Instagram and these connections to the outside world? Can you imagine if this pandemic had hit us in the 1990s? This would be really awful to not have these kind of connections we have with people, kind of like we're connecting with each other right now. Thank God for these technologies. So I think that we need to do away with this ridiculous hierarchy that, oh, how you spend your time, uh, that's fr frivolous, right? That's a waste of time, that's a distraction. But how I spend my time, that's somehow okay, right? Uh, you playing video games and watching uh, YouTube videos, bad. Me watching football on TV, that's good. That's ridiculous. Anything can be an act of traction as long as you do it with intent. So it's not about the technology. If you want to scroll Facebook, if you want to watch YouTube videos, great, do it, enjoy. There's so much good stuff out there. But do it on your schedule, not on the tech company's schedule. And so the difference between traction and distraction is one word. And that one word is forethought. That if we decide to use these tools on our schedule and according to our values, there's nothing wrong with it. And so we need to stop demonizing technology and make sure that we control the tech as opposed to the tech controlling us. So, okay, so back to your question. We have traction and we have distraction. Now, what prompts us to take these actions? We have two types of triggers. We have external triggers that can lead us towards traction or distraction. And then we have what we call the internal triggers. Now, external triggers, this is the usual suspects, right? These are the, the pings, the dings, the rings all of the things in our outside environment that can lead us towards traction or distraction. Now, um, you know, we, we, we can talk about this in a minute, and there are many ways that we can do what I call hacking back the external triggers. But in my research, what I found was that the leading cause of distraction is not what is happening outside of us, but rather most distraction begins from within. That it's not just about the pings and dings and rings, it's about what is happening inside our own head, that the number one source of distraction, the leading cause of distraction is what we call an internal trigger. What is an internal trigger? An internal trigger is an, uh, is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape from. It's loneliness, boredom, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. This is why we tend to get distracted. As much as we like to blame the stuff outside of ourselves, in reality, it is our inability to cope with emotional discomfort that prompts us to look for relief somewhere. So if you are lonely, check Facebook. If you're uncertain, Google it. If you're bored, oh my goodness, tons of solutions for boredom, right? Watch that YouTube video, scroll Reddit, check Pinterest. Endless solutions, right? Watch the news so we can worry about somebody else's problem halfway around the world as opposed to having to figure out what's going on inside our own heads. All of these solutions provide relief from emotional discomfort, which is why one of the most important lessons of the book, Indistractable, is that time management is pain management. That no tricks and tips and techniques and life hacks work unless you start with what is going on inside your own head. What is that discomfort that you are looking to escape? And if we can identify it, we can do something about it. And I teach you techniques. These are not techniques that I made up. These are techniques that have been around for decades. Uh, I draw upon acceptance and commitment therapy and many other uh, peer reviewed techniques that are very effective in helping anyone master the internal trigger. So that is step one of four to become indistractable is to master the internal triggers. Now this makes me think Back when I was in medical school, we were studying all the time. And I definitely demonized or like vilified technology, apps, things like that, because I would find that, you know, you have these study marathons and there were certain blocks that I didn't like, you know, so let's say I'm on nephrology or, or renal looking at, you know, kidneys, it wasn't my favorite of the blocks. And I would more quickly get into a state where I was kind of done with studying. And then 
what I noticed is like if I just you know went to the um, the break room and played a round of ping pong with my friend, it's like okay, we know we play two ping pong games, we get back to work. Whereas if I pick up my phone or if I go on YouTube or something like that, then that five minutes or ten minutes becomes like thirty or forty-five, and I'm like, oh my god, where did all the time go? Do you see what I'm saying with like vilifying the technology and, and that distraction? Because I was getting distracted either way, so it's like one distraction was more dangerous than the other. For you in that context, uh, you know, when I went to uh, undergrad, uh, the internet was very slow, and uh, we didn't have uh, apps. This was before the iPhone came out. And I remember many times when I was studying uh, and doing something I didn't want to do, and you know, one of my friends would say, "Hey, let's let's play ping pong," and we didn't play for ten minutes. We played for hours uh, because, look, distraction is nothing new. Uh, Plato talked about this problem twenty five hundred years ago. He called it akrasia, the tendency to do things against our better interest. So, you know, what what continues to happen is that uh, products and services get better right? That of course, these technologies that we carry around with our pocket, with us in our pockets, they are designed to give you what you are looking for. If you are looking to scratch an uncomfortable emotional state, which all of them are designed to do. I mean, I, my first book was called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And, and I, I essentially wrote the book about the deeper psychology of how these products get you hooked. And they are very much designed to do that. The thing is, we can't do anything about that. Right? That is not going to change. You know, there are two types of people when it comes to how we cope with, uh, sorry, three types of people in terms of how we cope with, with distraction. The first group is what we call the blamers. Uh, the blamers, they blame things outside themselves, right? It's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's the modern world these days. They blame things outside of themselves for getting them distracted. But of course, you know, there is no time machine to take us to a, a period where people weren't distracted. In fact, it never existed. People have always been distracted by one thing or another. The conversation that we have today around social media and video games is verbatim the exact same things people said about television, about radio, about the novel, all the way back to the written words. Socrates said that this technology, this terrible technology of writing words down were going to enfeeble men's minds. So this has always been our excuse. Oh, it's this thing that's, that's taking me off track. The fact of the matter is it's part of the human condition. We can't change that. So blaming is not effective. The other extreme is what we call shaming. So the blamers blame things outside themselves. The shamers shame themselves. They say, oh, you see, I have an addictive personality. Uh, I must have ADHD. Uh, you see, there I go again. I have such a short attention span. There must be something wrong with me, something broken. And for the vast majority of people, there's nothing wrong with them. There's not there, there's 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 nothing. Uh, uh, there's no pathology that underlines their their penchant for distraction. We all have this tendency. It's perfectly normal. It's perfectly human. And, and I think the problem is that when we shame ourselves, when we say that that distraction, procrastination, is some kind of moral failing, that we're somehow broken or dysfunctional, we in fact cause the very uh, impulse that leads us towards distraction. Because what do we do when we feel shame, when we feel broken, when we feel like there's something wrong with us? Shame is a very uncomfortable internal trigger. And when we feel shame, we look for escape. What do we look to uh, escape with? Well, more distraction to take our mind off of that uncomfortable state. So what we want to be is we don't want to be blamers. We don't want to be shamers. We want to be what we call claimers. Claimers claim responsibility for their response to those internal triggers. So uh, the, it's very an analogous to feeling the urge to sneeze, right? You do not control your feelings. This is a, 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 a not a widely understood concept. You don't control your feelings just the way you, won't, you wouldn't control your urge to sneeze. If you feel the urge to sneeze, it's too late. You've already felt that urge. All you can control is how you respond, hence the term responsibility, how you respond to those urges. So when you feel the urge to sneeze, do you sneeze all over everyone and get them sick? No, you, you take out a handkerchief and you cover your face because that's the responsible thing to do. And the same thing goes with our sensations. When we have these internal triggers such as boredom, anxiety, stress, fatigue, uncertainty, whatever it might be, do we escape? Do we look to get out of our own heads? Or do we use that internal trigger like rocket fuel to propel us towards acts of traction rather than distraction? 
So in summary, the thing is, these distractions are not your fault, right? You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent the internet. These things are not your fault, but they are your responsibility. They are a fact of life. And our only choice is to learn how to live with them and use them to our advantage as opposed to being subservient to these distractions. I love it. By taking responsibility, then the person has is not a victim to the circumstance. They can actually do something about it and then take ownership, take control of their life. What was the second step? We are so much more powerful, right? It's like not even a close comparison. Yeah, in the media these days, we always hear about how technology is addicting you, how it's hijacking your brain. And of course, ironically enough, the reason that reporters and journalists write that way is because it's clickbait, right? The way the New York Times makes money is the same way Facebook makes money. They sell your eyeballs to advertisers. Does anybody not know that? And so, of course, they gin up these, these accusations that technology is something that's hijacking your brain is addictive. Everything all of a sudden has become addictive. We've pathologized what is an otherwise normal behavior because when we call something an addiction, which, as you well know, is a pathology, not everyone is addicted to everything, right? Many people enjoy a glass of wine with dinner. But is everyone an alcoholic? Of course not. Small, single-digit percentages of people are alcoholic. Same goes with social media, right? Are some people addicted to technology or social media or video games? Of course, some people are, small single digit percentages. But that doesn't mean everyone is. But of course, we like that language. We want to say that we are addicted because when I'm addicted, I don't have control. There's a drug dealer doing it to me. The social media algorithms are doing these things to me. It's not my fault. As opposed to when we talk about it, what it really is, it's not an addiction for the vast majority of people. It is a distraction. But of course, distractions, oh, that's no fun. Now I got to do something about it. That's much less charged language. This is making a lot of sense. I never thought of it this way. When you, so you were talking about the first step. What was the second step before? So the first step is mastering the internal triggers. It's about understanding these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape from. We have to do that first. The second step is to make time for traction. So earlier we talked about traction and distraction. So if there's a, if there's a mantra, I would love everyone to, to remember, maybe write this down if you can, if you're listening, uh, is that you cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Let me say that again. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So it turns out that two thirds of Americans don't keep any sort of a calendar. And even the one third who do barely use it. And so here's the, here's the thing. If you don't have anything on your schedule, right? If you didn't plan anything in your day, you have no right to say you got distracted from something. What exactly did you get distracted from? If your calendar is full of blanks white space, well, then everything is a distraction because you didn't decide what you wanted to do with your time. So the second step is to make time for traction, that planning out your day is no longer a luxury, that you know, there's a reason we call it paying attention. We pay attention just like we pay with dollars and cents. And so you wouldn't just give money to anybody who asks you for some, right? You wouldn't just say like, hey, I got hundreds and twenties and tens here, just take my money. And yet we do that with our time all the time. Anybody who wants our time, our kids, our boss, our, uh, our friends, our, 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 the news, whatever happened on Twitter, here, just take my time. As opposed to being judicious about budgeting that time and saying, wait a minute, how do I want to spend my day? Uh, it, because if you don't plan your day, somebody will plan it for you. There are too many people out there who have an interest in making sure that they can take your time and manipulating your time to do whatever they want with it. And so that's why I say the skill of the century is the ability to control your time, control your attention, and this is how we choose our life. So making time for traction is all about planning in advance how you want to spend your time which includes, by the way, not just the productive worky stuff, but also the fun stuff, right? So here's the, here's the amazing thing. We can take distractions and turn them into traction by simply making time for them. So on my calendar, there is time for social media, right? Because I like social media, right? It's, a, it's in accordance with my values and I have time in my day 
to enjoy those things. I love YouTube videos. I love time on Instagram. I love Facebook. They're wonderful tools. And I've turned what would otherwise have been a distraction, things that I went to for emotional escape to something I do deliberately by planning for them on my schedule. Now, from reading your book, it's clear you're a fan of time boxing. And I've had like mixed results. I, you know, during COVID at the very beginning, this whole, the whole social distancing was very tough for me. And to get some like control back over this, you know, chaos that was occurring around me, I got very, very structured with my time. I woke up every day, 6 a.m. I started working on my, you know, like focused work, you know, 11 or 8 a.m. to 11. Then I have my first meal for 30 minutes. Then I do like my admin work, um, you know, then I have my workout and then I do my, my creative work in the evening. And what you're pointing to with like, you know, structuring time for also the the YouTube, the social media, things like that, that was helpful because I had a rule after dinner, which was normally, you know, 6 to 8 p.m., I would have like a social call with, you know, one of my friends, 8 to 9, trying to stay connected with my friends. And then the rule was no work after that. And that was actually really helpful because if I just kept working and working and working, which, you know, I think a lot of people, especially if you're you're starting your own business or project, there's always something to do. You're always behind. And in, in school too, students are always feeling behind, so they always feel like they need to study. But then what happens is I'll do that for weeks and weeks and then my effectiveness will actually go down because I'm burning out. Whereas when I make the time, then it's like I'm constantly recharging and staying more balanced. So I think that's like kind of a, that's not quite time boxing, is it? It's kind of like a, you know, a rough idea of how I'm spending my days. When I think of time boxing, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I imagine like, okay, you know, hour, hour one, I'm doing emails, hour two, I'm doing this project, hour three, I'm doing that project. And it almost seems, it almost seems, uh, I guess, kind of difficult to even approach. Wait, so what's the difference between time boxing and what you were doing? It sounds a lot like time boxing. What do you think is the difference? I guess it's kind of like rough, rough categories of how I want to do like admin work versus focus work. When I imagine time boxing, I imagine like, okay, this hour I'm doing this project, this work, um, one hour at a time. So you can define that time however you wish. I think the important thing is that you need to time box uh, to the exclusion of distractions. I think this is a really important point. It sounds to me like you actually were time boxing, but maybe you, you, your conception of it that it has to be very, very specific. I, I don't think it does. Let, let me give you a good example. So um, I have a, a, a beautiful 12 year old daughter and we spend a lot of time together. She's homeschooled and I work from home. So we're, we're fortunate that we get to spend a lot of time together. Now, uh, uh, twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays, we have big three hour chunks of time together. Now, do I plan out, okay, from uh, 3 to 3.15, we get ice cream. From uh, from 3.15 to 3.30, we, you know, no, I don't do that kind of specificity. I have three hours blocked out time with my daughter. Now, why do I do that? I don't time block every tiny thing we do. I time block that big span of three hours with my daughter so that I know what I will not be doing with my time. That traction for that period of time, what I decided I want to do, is whatever my daughter wants to do. So if she wants to go to the park, we'll go to the park. If she wants to go to the museum, we'll do that. We'll, what we call it planned spontaneity, right? I have planned that time to be with her, but what we do during that time period is whatever she wants. But the reason I plan that time on my schedule is so that I will know what I will not be doing with that time. I will not be on a work call. I will not be on social media. I will not be checking email. And if I don't block that time out and no, no, that is time that I have devoted to living out one of my values of being a good father, then I know, because I used to do this before I wrote this book, is that I'll get distracted by something else. Something will always come up. Oh, this work obligation or, oh, this, uh, this thing demands my attention. So by blocking out that time, even if it's a big swath of three hours of time, I know what I will not be doing with my time. So the reason this is so important is that I can finally know the difference for every minute of my day between what is traction and what is distraction. The only way to know what a distraction is, is to define what is traction. So if you say to yourself, hey, look, for the next two hours, I'm going to work on admin tasks. Great. That's what I do. I keep a big old block of time. Uh, for example, uh, every Monday, I have what I call Message Mondays, three hours. 
to flush through emails that need to be returned sometime this week. I don't budget out time for every single email, of course. I just have a block of time so that I know what I will not be doing with that time. So now I've defined the difference between traction and distraction. And a really important point here is that you don't make a time box calendar once. You revise it continuously. The idea, the mindset is not to be a drill sergeant, but to be a scientist. So you are experimenting week to week to figure out how to make your calendar easier to follow, how to make it more aligned with your values, how to make it something that, that uh, doesn't require as much effort week to week. And so you're adjusting it. You know, if I have uh, some meetings that I can't move around that I've uh, obligated myself to, well, I can move around other things in my schedule. But the idea here is to do it in advance, not to do it the day of, because if you do it the day of, or in the moment, I should say, that's when you're likely to get distracted because of those internal triggers. Oh, this is hard. I don't really want to do this right now. This is boring. I should probably do something else. That's when you get into trouble. That's when you get led into distraction versus committing to that act of traction. Okay, this makes sense. So from all the tutorials I saw, I thought that you have to be like super granular. When I was studying for uh, my first board exam, I had, you know, every 30 minutes for six weeks planned out. It was like this day I'm studying, you know, this subject, that subject, this is how many practices I'm doing at each moment. It was so like, I like never wanted to do that again. So I guess I, I had this negative association of time boxing. Like, no, I'm, I'm done with that. I've done, I've done my time. Um, so it can be, it's flexible. If it becomes onerous, if it becomes difficult, then you, you're, you're doing it wrong. It's a sure sign that it's not working. Uh, because again, right. you, week over week, what I talk about in the book is that you have to find ways to make it easier to follow your schedule, not, not more difficult. So if it leaves you with a bad taste, it's, it's not working. Now, what I would advise against and what I'm, I'm kind of on a mission to, uh, to convince people to stop doing is to, uh, to we need to destroy the to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> that I call this the tyranny of the to-do list. Uh, what most people do uh, in the absence of a time box calendar is that they wake up in the morning and they look at their to-do list and that's what they do for their day. And it's not that to-do lists are bad per se. I keep a to-do list, but I only look at that to-do list when I have time on my time box calendar for admin tasks, right? That, that, that's when I look at my to-do list. What most people do, they wake up in the morning and say, what do I do today? Well, let me look at my to-do list. And so what do we do first? We do the easy stuff, not the important stuff. We do the easy stuff. And the, uh, another terrible thing about keeping a to-do list and running your life based on a to-do list, to list, I should say, is that we begin to measure ourselves based on how much stuff we finish, right? Our metric for success is, well, how many little boxes did I get to check off my day? And of course, that's a horrible metric because there are so many exogenous factors that determine how much you will finish in a day, right? Humans are terrible at predicting how long stuff will take them to do. So instead of measuring yourself based on output, you measure yourself based on input. And that input is only two things, time and attention. That's it, that's your only input. So we measure ourselves with a time box calendar based on did I do whatever it is I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction. So you begin to reinforce a self-image of, okay, I did this for 30 minutes, I did this for an hour, I did this for three hours, because that's what I said I would do. And you begin to reinforce this self-image of someone who lives with personal self-efficacy, someone who is indistractable, someone who does what they say they're going to do, as opposed to with the to-do list, if you run your life based on what's on that to-do list, you know, day after day, you're reinforcing a self-image of, Another day went by and I didn't finish everything on my to-do list. And that begins to take a toll on your psyche. You begin to believe that it's okay to not live up to your commitments to yourself. And then you've lost the war. Right. And the other thing about to-do lists, I always get super ambitious as to what I can do in a certain you know, day or, or week. I, it just, I'm looking at my to-do list right now. It's already, you know, there's, there's things that I've missed today that I want to get done. And what I've also found helpful is that every Sunday, I've actually have it in my calendar, you know, Every Sunday evening, I have 30 minutes just to review my to-do list, which primarily includes, you know, adding things from my inbox to like categories on my to-do list. I use things three. And also taking those things that I've fallen behind on and rescheduling them and saying, okay, that wasn't done last week. It's not super urgent. When can I get it done by? And then I push it out later. And like, it's, it's a weekly thing. I'm always behind my to-do list 
any given day. And you are, you are, you, it, it's as if you are reciting the script of my life, what it used to look like before I start on this line of research and, and why I hate to do lists so much <laughs> because the, you know, it's, it's incredible how, uh, you know, I used to use to do lists for years. And again, there's a difference here. I'm not saying that to do lists are, are, you know, keeping a list of the things you need to do are, is bad. I'm saying that running your life based on a to do list, like waking up in the morning and saying, what do I do next? What do I do next? Look at the to do list. That's the part that sucks. And, and the reason is, is that, you know, if, if you went to the, to uh, buy a new phone, okay, you buy a new phone and every day, uh, the operating system of your new phone crashes, wouldn't you eventually say like after a few days, Hey, uh, this is defective. Okay. You take it back to the store and you get a new one. And yet to do list, the, the operating system of my life kept crashing day after day. I would say I was going to do all this stuff and I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't finish. And in, in fact, I've never met anyone who runs their life on a to-do list and finishes everything on their list. Never, because it's so easy to add stuff. You just keep adding and adding and adding. And with no constraint around when actually is that going to get done, you get this crappy feeling day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that you are someone who can't do what they say they're going to do. And once you begin to believe that, that's where people after years say, oh, I have a short attention span. I have an addictive personality. I can't seem to concentrate. There must be something wrong with me. Give me a pill to fix my brain when there's nothing wrong with them. They just haven't learned the process to properly allocate their time and attention because of this horrible operating system that keeps crashing on us. Do you keep a to-do list or do you have a different system? I do keep a to-do list, but again, I don't look at the to-do list to tell me what to do. I look at my to-do list when I have time on my calendar for admin tasks. So if it's a big task that requires anything more than 15 minutes, I've scheduled that on my time box calendar. So in my weekly review, I'll look at the things that I you know, have on my, uh, that I need to get done and I'll immediately put those tasks that take more than about 15 minutes on my calendar. So I know if I need to do X, here is the place where I will do that on my calendar. But for the little stuff, you know, the admin stuff, the stuff that just takes a few minutes, less than 15 minutes, I'll block in an hour of admin time on my time box calendar and then tick off those things that are those admin related tasks. And then once a week for about 15 minutes, every Sunday night, I have it on my calendar. I sit down and I make the calendar for the week ahead and I allocate. I say, oh, you know what? Ooh, I got a lot of emails this week. I better make some more time to process emails or, oh, I've got some uh, meetings coming up. Am I going to get my writing time in? And I'll rejigger my calendar once a week to make sure that my time box calendar is easier to follow in the week ahead. Do you have any tips or suggestions to those who find resistance to trying time boxing? Because I, I, I mean, even now I was like, oh, I don't want to try this extreme time boxing. It seems really hardcore. I, I don't like doing that anymore. Um, what are common mistakes or ways to navigate this best? Sure, sure. So yeah, I, I get this a lot and I, I totally understand. Uh, firstly, uh, I've made it very, very easy. So there's a website you can go to uh, on my blog, nearandfar.com forward slash schedule hyphen maker. So nearandfar.com forward slash schedule hyphen maker. I built this free tool. You don't have to sign up for anything. No, you don't even have to give me your email. It's totally free. It's just an online tool I made. I, I, I built to make it really easy to get started time boxing. So that's number one. Use a tool that makes it easy. You don't have to use my tool. If you find, you know, I use, I use Google Calendar for myself. Uh, you can use Outlook. Whatever. You can use a pen and paper. It doesn't matter. The best tool is the one you actually will use. Uh, the second thing you need to know is that that resistance, that's what Stephen Pressfield called it. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The, the, uh, the War of Art where he talks about the resistance, that there's, there's this nagging voice that, that, that makes you not want to do the things that you know you should do, this driver of what Plato called akrasia. That is the fear that you may actually have to do the hard work you don't want to do. And we need to get comfortable with that. We need to be okay with realizing that feeling bad is not bad. That I think today we have so much messaging in the self-help community that tells us that uh, if you're struggling, if something is hard, if you're not happy all the time, something's wrong with you. And nothing could be further from the truth that we are evolved to be a species that is perpetually perturbed. That, th that feeling bad is not bad. It's not something we need to escape. In fact, it's something we need to lean into. So it's very much about changing that conversation to say, oh, okay, wait a minute. I really don't wanna do this, 
thing that I, I know I, 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 I is, is part of my values, is something I do want to do, where is that coming from, right? Like if I schedule my workout, this is what happened to me. I used to struggle with clinical obesity. I, I used to be clinically obese. And I remember when I, when I, when I came down to saying, okay, I'm going to schedule in my workout. Ugh, now that means I may actually have to go exercise <laughs> because I scheduled the time. Uh, and that's essentially the, you know, the rationalization of you knowing that, Ooh, now I got to do the hard work. And so that leads me to the third point, which is if you have that sensation, if you have that resistance of, I don't want to make a st time box calendar, it's too much work. Uh, I don't want to stifle my, my uh, spontaneity, whatever bullshit excuse you're making up for yourself, ask yourself if you really want it. Okay. And the way you ask yourself if you really want it is to ask yourself, what are your values? So what are values? Values are defined as the attributes of the person you want to become. Let me say that again. Very important. Attributes are defined as the attributes of the person you want to become. So what kind of attributes does the person you want to become, uh, what, what are those attributes, right? And so I guide readers through these three life domains, starting with you. You are at the center of these three life domains. So first ask yourself, what are the attributes of the person I want to become in terms of how the person I would want to become, how would they take care of themselves? And then what I want you to do is to turn your values into time. Right? I don't want you to do some hocus pocus vision board or visualization exercise. That stuff doesn't work. That's crap. Here's what I want you to do instead. I want you to ask yourself, how would the person you want to become spend their time? Okay, starting with the you domain. So not, not for next year, but just tomorrow. How much time would the person you want to become spend on themselves? If one of your values is physical health, well, do you have time in your calendar for proper rest? for exercise, I'm not saying those should be your values, but if those are among your values, put that time on your calendar. Don't just talk the talk, put the time on your calendar. Next, the, the relationship domain comes next. If being a, an available parent or a loving spouse or a, a, a caring son or daughter is important to you, again, not that it has to be, but if it is important to you, Put time for those relationships on your calendar. The reason we have this epidemic of loneliness these days in, in, in America is because we don't reserve the time we used to for our relationships. Uh, Robert Putnam talked about this in the 1990s. This is not a new problem. It's because we don't have those civic groups we used to have. You know, we don't have the bowling league anymore. We don't go to the church group like we used to. We don't have the Kiwanis club like they did, you know, in our, in our grandparents' generation. We need to bring that stuff back, to have that time on our schedule, even if it's through Zoom calls, right, to invest in the relationships and the people we love and have that time on your calendar held for them. And then finally, the last life domain where we have to consider our values is the work domain. So everybody's job has some element of reactive work and reflective work. Reactive work is the check, you know, reacting to emails, reacting to phone calls, reacting to Slack notifications. It's probably the majority of most people's jobs, right? The problem is if we only do reactive work, we have no time for the reflective work. And the reflective work is the kind of work that is the highest value, the thinking, the planning, the strategizing. So if reacting is running real fast, reflecting ensures that we're running in the right direction. But most people don't allocate any time for the reflective work. And so we have to plan that time as well. We have, it's okay if six, seven hours of your workday is spent reacting. Many people have jobs where all they're doing is reacting, especially doctors. But we need at least some time in our day, in our workday, to think, to reflect, to plan. And that can only come with time spent without distraction. So I think that's, that's a great way to, to get started with time boxing, is to consider these three life domains of you, your relationships, and finally your work, and to turn those values, whatever they are, into time, to actually see that time on your calendar. And again, making time for the things that you find fun, right? So if you want time for video games and Netflix, great put that time on your calendar as well and keep it sacred because now anything that is not that, even if you say, I want to play video games for an hour, great. Anything else suddenly becomes a distraction. So keep that time sacred as well. I'm guessing if I remember correctly, part three is hacking back external triggers. Is that right? Right. Okay. This is my favorite one because I totally geek out on this probably because it's so actionable with like 
what settings you have on your phone, what apps do you use to control your use of other apps. Um, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, overstate its importance. I think part one, part two are obviously you need to build that foundation. Let's talk about that. I, in my experience, a couple things have helped. On the phone, all notifications are disabled for sound except for phone calls. I don't even get text message sounds. Um, I only get text message like on the um, on the lock screen. I don't have badges because the badges make you feel like you need to check something. So I disabled badges. I actually have wireless chargers in a couple different rooms so that my phone is not next to my table it's on the charger it's like out of reach out of sight um and then on my computer i have i use i think it's called it's called focus that's the same thing as freedom self-control these other apps and i didn't think i needed it i was like oh you know when i work i work and when i don't work i don't work but then I, once i started using it there were so many times when i would just like instinctively check a website and it would block me i'd be like oh my god i didn't even realize that I was getting distracted in that moment. So what have you found most helpful for yourself or for other people when it comes to hacking back these external distractions? So this is a, a big one. Um, and I think the important thing is that it needs to come after the first two steps. So I think where, where people, uh, I think when it comes to productivity and procrastination and distraction, people are always looking for that magic bullet, right? The one solution, the one life hack that will solve the problem. And I don't think that exists. I think it's about using these four techniques in concert. Uh, so they are mastering the internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back the external triggers and preventing distraction with PACT. And when you use all four in concert, this is where we become indistractable. This is where it becomes a piece of cake to make sure you do what you say you're going to do uh, when you use them in concert. But if you jump around, if you, if you go straight to the hacking back of external triggers and you see this a lot, right? Like, uh, five ways to make your iPhone uh, less distracting. Well, that's fine, but if you haven't first figured out the internal triggers that are prompting you to look for the distraction in the first place, or you haven't made time in your schedule to live out your values, you're gonna find distraction off of your iPhone. You'll find it somewhere else. So just to reemphasize, you have to do those first two steps before this third step, but this critical third step is very, very effective, partially because so few people do it right? Two thirds of people with a smartphone, think about this, two thirds of people with a smartphone never change their notification settings. What? <laughs> Can we honestly say that this technology is addicting us and it's hijacking our brains when you haven't taken five minutes to change your notification settings so you're not getting these pings and dings every five minutes, right? And guess what? There's nothing that Tim Cook or Mark Zuckerberg or, or any of these CEOs that these big tongue companies can do if you turn the notifications off. So taking a few minutes to change your notification settings, this is kindergarten stuff. I barely cover this in the book because it's so easy to do. There is one chapter about hacking back your phone, but I also want to show people how to hack back the less obvious distractions in their environment. So there's a whole section on how to hack back meetings. Oh my goodness, how much of a distraction are, you know, for those of us who work in a corporate setting, especially now that we're on Zoom 24 hours a day, how many meetings do we have in our day that are conducted purely for the rationale of giving whoever called the meeting uh, a space to hear themselves talk out loud? <laughs> They're complete distractions. Uh, email can be a complete distraction, right? So I show people how to, uh, how to uh, get control over their email inbox. It's a very habit-forming technology that I show you systematically how to hack back. Uh, uh, YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and Twitter, you know, there are all kinds of tools out there that can help us hack back. So the reason I use that terminology, hack back, is because to hack in computer hacker parlance, means to gain unauthorized access to something, right? So a computer hacker might hack into a bank account to get unauthorized access to someone's money. Well, these companies are trying to gain unauthorized access to our brains, right? Every media company, not just Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, every media company, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, they're all in the same business model of monetizing your attention by selling it to advertisers. But just because they're trying to hack your attention doesn't mean we can't hack back. And so I show you systematically how to use technology to, in fact, uh, uh, you know, change that very same technology that we find so distracting. So, for example, um, I love Facebook. 
but I hate the newsfeed because the newsfeed is designed to hook you, right? I wrote the book on how these companies do it, and I know that they use a lot of very sophisticated psychology and behavioral design to keep you coming back. Well, when I use Facebook, I don't just go to the homepage or the newsfeed. I have a, a Chrome extension that's totally free called Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator, and it does exactly what it says. It just gets rid of your newsfeed, and there's nothing Zuckerberg can do about that. Right? I don't want to see that news feed full of cat videos and political commentary and all that crap. I want to see what's happening uh, with my friend Kevin. So I'm going to go straight to his page and I can hack back that technology to serve me as opposed to me serving it. Uh, so we can do that with, with uh, our phones, with our computers, with our social media sites. Uh, also, one, one thing that I think might be particularly helpful uh, now that so many of us are not working in offices, uh, many of us are working from home, we find that our partners or our roommates or our kids can be a huge source of distraction. As much as we love the kiddos, when you're trying to work, when you're trying to, 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 to do something without distraction, uh, a, a child interrupting you can be very distracting. So what do we do about that? I'm going to show you. Is it okay if I share with you a very quick technique? Yeah, please do. So this is called the concentration crown. And uh, the idea here is that you sit down with your, your child and you say, look, when mommy or daddy wears the concentration crown, and we started doing this my, with my daughter when she was you know, six or seven years old, she understood this very easily, you find the silliest hat you have. So here's mine, this is my concentration crown. And so my daughter knows when daddy is wearing the concentration crown, that means that he is doing his focused work, he cannot be interrupted. And so as soon as she sees that I'm wearing this hat, I've interrupted the interruption. I, I, she can clearly see, oh, you know, uh, interrupting daddy is off limits. Very, very effective, very simple, very cheap uh, uh, technique. Not only is it great with kids, it's actually incredibly effective with roommates and spouses as well. You could even use maybe, a, or maybe this wouldn't work. I'm, I'm thinking like with my girlfriend, headphones. Hey, if I'm wearing headphones and I'm working like... Yeah, they're, they're tricky because... Uh, uh, so if, if, if that works for you, if you can communicate that with your, with your girlfriend or, or, or significant other, wonderful. Uh, many times people can't tell the difference between when you are listening to a YouTube video and can be interrupted versus when you are trying to focus. So uh, because it's not, uh, uh, it's not necessarily clear what you're doing, what, what you're listening to, sometimes people find that, that that doesn't work, especially in a corporate setting. You know, when you're working in a cubicle and someone stops by your desk and they see you with earphones, they just think you're listening to music. And so what's the big deal? I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, so when you, when, so in a corporate setting, actually, you can't use the concentration crown. That would be ridiculous. Let me show you what you do instead. Um, so in every copy of Indistractable, there is a screen sign that comes printed inside the book. And so what you do is you actually tear out this screen sign. It's printed on cardstock and you fold it into thirds and you put it on your computer monitor. So when we do go back to an office setting, uh, we, we can use this to tell our colleagues, hey, I can't be interrupted at the moment, I'm indistractable. And actually, uh, this will be interesting because you, you have a medical background. This insight came to me from these, uh, these vests that nurses have started wearing to reduce prescription mistakes. Have you seen those? I, I haven't seen it in person, but I, 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 yeah, I read that section in the book. Yeah, amazing. It reduced medication errors by 88% when nurses started wearing these vests that said drug round in progress, do not disturb. And so I adapted that insight for, uh, for those of us who, who work in office settings when we're allowed to go back. It's, it's kind of interesting because you see this theme, you're talking about it in aviation, pilots were getting distracted and now they have these rules, you know, below 10,000 feet, you can't do things that are non-essential. You're seeing it in healthcare. Um, it's like this trickle effect. You just see it spreading, and, and if only we could appreciate its importance sooner and act on it quicker, then everyone would win. Now let's talk about let's talk about packs. What what are packs? Okay, so this is the fourth step. So again, first we have to master the internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back the external triggers. Then the last step, and this is the firewall, this is the last line of defense to make sure we don't get distracted. This is where we make some kind of promise to ourselves, to someone else, or with a technology, ironically enough, to help us control distraction. And so what does a pact look like? A pact is some kind of promise, some kind of pre-commitment that we make. Uh, so for example, you mentioned one earlier where we can use technology to help us uh, prevent getting distracted. So I use an app very similar to what you use. I, I use uh, Self-Control. And Self-Control is a free app that I use on my Mac 
that whenever I'm doing uh, focused work, whenever I'm writing, and I, 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 I constantly feel the internal trigger of, this is hard, this is boring, is anybody gonna like this, is this any good? And all I wanna do is just go do some quick research, right? Let me just Google this real quick. And to prevent me from doing that, um, and going down that rabbit hole of Googling or looking at Wikipedia or whatever it might be for half an hour as opposed to doing what I said I'm going to do, when I do my focused work, when I, when I write, I click this button uh, for this app called Self Control and it blocks out all of those distracting sites. So I can't access email or Google or Facebook or YouTube when I said I'm going to do focused work for that 45 minute period or whatever it is that you, you need to do your focused work. So that's a form of a pact. It's called an effort pact. An effort pact is when there's a bit of friction between you and the thing you don't want to do, the distraction. So if I mindlessly say, oh, let me just Google this thing real quick, I'll get that, that screen that says, oh, nope, you made a pact with yourself, you made a promise, that that's not what you're going to do with your time, get back to the task at hand. Uh, another effort pact that we use in my household, uh, you know, many years ago, my wife and I found that we were going to bed later and later every night. So not only were we not getting enough sleep, uh, you know, we've been married for 18 years and we found that we weren't intimate with each other. Our sex life suffered because I was, you know, caressing my phone and she was fondling her iPad as opposed to being together. And so now we have, uh, we, we, we went to the hardware store and we bought a $10 outlet timer. And that outlet timer will turn off or on anything that's plugged into it at a certain time of day or night. So in my household, every night at 10 p.m., the internet router shuts off automatically, 10 p.m. every night. So that now we know, okay, 10 p.m. is coming, hurry up, finish everything you need to do because the internet will shut off whether you like it or not. And that, that was a way we made a pact, a promise with ourselves that we would do what we said we were going to do. And in conjunction with the other three things we talked about can be a very, very powerful technique. So those are effort packs. Like, you know, of course, the reason we call it an effort pack is that it would take me some effort, right? I could reboot my computer to disable self-control. I could unplug the internet router and replug it in so that I would get power to it. I could do that, but that takes effort. Right, and that bit of effort is enough to remind me. Oh, wait a minute! Is this really what I want to do right now? It, it helps me be mindful over something that I otherwise would do mindlessly in the past. So that's an effort pact. There are also what we call price pacts, where we set some kind of monetary disincentive to getting distracted. Uh, and then finally, there's what we call an identity pact, which is probably the most powerful of the three pacts. This is when we begin to shape our self-image in accordance with what we want to do. Uh, and this comes out of the psychology of religion. So when someone says that they are a devout Muslim uh, or uh, an observant Christian or whatever the case might be, it makes uh, doing what they said they're going to be do, do much easier so they can be what they said they're going to be, so they can live up to that identity. Even if you think about um, when someone says that they're a vegetarian, right? A vegetarian doesn't wake up in the morning and say, hmm, should I have some bacon for breakfast or not? No, that, that decision has already been made because uh, vegetarians don't eat meat. It is who they are. And so that helps them live up to their values by declaring some kind of moniker, some kind of identity, which is why the book is called Indistractable. This is your new moniker. Even if you haven't read the book, if you've listened this far, you understand the four basic steps of becoming indistractable. And by having that moniker, by saying that identity of, look, this is who I am. I do some things that are a little bit different from most people, okay? I use these various techniques. I time box my day. I don't respond to every phone call and text message within five seconds of getting it. I am indistractable. I decide how I control my attention, how I control my time and my life. Speaking to the, um, the vegetarian example, I was doing a plant-based diet for like four to five years. And the shocking thing to me was how easy it was to not eat meat, to not eat dairy when I took on that identity. And then towards the end, I was very much doing it for health reasons because I have, you know, a, uh, I have inflammatory bowel disease and I was trying to figure out what foods and stuff would make me just as healthy as possible. And then there was some research talking about, you know, small amounts of meat were actually beneficial. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have two servings of meat per week. And then when I actually started doing that, it was way harder because it, now at each moment, at each meal, am I eating meat? Am I not? I'm not plant-based anymore, but like, I don't want to eat too much meat. So paradoxically, that was much harder than just being plant-based outright. It's, it's very true. I, I, uh, um, uh, 
Yeah, that, that, that many times it's easier to go uh, extreme through an identity to say, this is something I don't do versus I can't do. Uh, there's there's a quite a bit of research that actually just changing that language uh, makes it an identity. When someone says, I don't, uh, it's much stronger because it's identity based, it's based, it's who I am versus, oh no, I can't. I can't eat that chocolate cake versus I don't eat refined sugars right? If you don't, that's something you never do. That is who you are versus, oh, I can't. There's still a decision uh, that can be made there. Nir, I want to thank you for writing this book. It was an excellent read. I'm actually making a book summary of this on the Med School Insider channel, which will be going out by the time you guys see this video. So all the viewers, you guys can find a link to the book down in the description. Nir, where, where else can people find you online? Yeah, thank you. So my website is nearandfar.com. Nir is spelled like my first name. So that's N-I-R and far.com. Nir is spelled like my first name. Uh, and actually, I just wanted to mention that there's a free uh, 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 workbook on my site that anybody can get. It was a, it's an 80-page workbook. You can use it whether you buy the book or not. We actually couldn't fit, uh, fit it into the final edition of the book, so we decided to make it available online, and that's available at my website. And the book, again, is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, and it's available wherever books are sold. Awesome. We'll have links to all those down in the description. And any, any final words, anything else you want to tell the viewers? You know, I, th I think if you, if you were to summarize the book into one mantra, uh, it would be that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. That's really the lesson that I learned over the five years researching and writing this book, is that distraction, procrastination is really an impulse control problem. It's not a character flaw. Uh, there's most likely nothing wrong with you. It's simply that we don't know how to deal with these impulses. The good news is, that the antidote to every impulse is forethought, that our species comes with this amazing ability to see into the future. But if you leave these kinds of decisions to the last minute, you will lose, right? If, uh, if the cigarette is lit in your hand, you're gonna smoke it. If the chocolate cake is on the fork on its way to your mouth, you're gonna eat it. If you sleep next to your cell phone every night on your nightstand, it's gonna be the first thing you reach for in the morning. So you can't leave it to the last minute. And in fact, one of the things I was surprised to learn in researching this book is that the people who are indistractable, they don't have a tremendous amount of willpower and self-control. That is not the defining trait. They have just as, amount of, um, as much willpower and self-control as anyone else. What they have is a system. They have planned ahead. So it doesn't matter how powerful the algorithms are or how amazingly addictive the technologies are. There is no distraction that we cannot overcome if we plan ahead. So the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, Nir, and we'll see you soon. My pleasure, thanks so much.